Welcome to Experimental. The science show where people freeze in the snow, toads dance, and women drink their pee. Coming up, why this man has a problem with chickens. If you touch chickens, it increases the poultry pleasure in a scientific way. And why this man has a problem with women. But first, we're off to Switzerland and the peaceful suburbs of Zurich. Or are they? Sadly not. You see, hidden deep beneath the snow-capped roofs, there lurks... ..the sound of snoring. <laughs> A sound so bad, it's driving some people to want to kill. Tim! But now, there is potential relief for the long-suffering citizens of Zurich's snoring zone. No, Tibetan Buddhism has not put down new roots in the Alps. These frozen gnomes of Zurich are undertaking the latest low-tech cure to nighttime rumbles. Prescribed by this man, Dr. Milo Puhan, and his team at the local hospital. The playing of the didgeridoo. Well, with the didgeridoo, we try to exercise the muscles of the upper airways, and thereby the collapsibility of the airways is reduced, so we don't snore anymore, and you have less sleep apneas. Snoring occurs when the muscles at the back of the throat relax and collapse in on one another, causing them to vibrate as we breathe in and out. In most cases, it simply causes a vibration and that annoying noise. But in some cases, the muscles get stuck together, blocking the airways and effectively stopping the patient breathing. It's called sleep apnea, and at the very least, it leads to the patient constantly waking up. But in the worst cases, it results in high blood pressure and heart disease. But what is it about playing the didgeridoo that's so beneficial? Why not the bagpipes or the trombone? Well, in part, it's the sound of the didgeridoo. It seems that its low frequencies give the throat the perfect massage, as Dr. Puhan's assistant, Dr. Brandley, will demonstrate to those of you who are not squeamish. With the bronchoscope passing through the nose, I can show you where the snoring happens and the apneas. Further down in the nose, you will see a valve which closes the nose through the mouth and where by vibration you have the snoring sound and by complete closure you have the apneas. And now, a television first didgeridoo playing as never seen before, from the inside. And you can immediately see what a workout the low frequency of the didgeridoo gives the throat. In addition to the good vibrations of the didgeridoo is the technique of circular breathing that it requires. To keep the note continuous, players have to breathe in through the nose at the same time as breathing out through the mouth. To achieve this, a skilled player blows normally from the lungs, keeping the cheeks full of air. To take a breath, he closes the glottis, the gap between the vocal cords, and blows the remaining air in his mouth into the didgeridoo while breathing in through his nose. And that strengthens exactly the muscles that collapse during snoring and sleep apnea. At first, I had uh, 17 sleep apneas per hour in the night, and uh, I was snoring. And after five to six months, I, was, I wasn't a snorer. I had no snoring uh, acoustic, and uh, I hadn't apneas. There is one problem with the treatment, though. There is a danger that for some people, one unacceptable noise is replaced by another. In 
a moment, we'll be going to caress some chickens with Dr Chuck in Singapore. But first, it's off to the test department and a man who's interested in caressing women. Our test department demonstrator, Horace, wants to have babies. And for that, he needs one of these. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm. But Horace wants to ensure that his babies are as healthy as possible. And for that, he has raided the experimentals library. After many hours, his eyes alight on the work of Swiss scientist Klaus Wiedekind at the University of Bern. Apparently, he's come across evidence that women's choice of a mate is, in part, influenced by smell. Not the stuff out of a can, but good old-fashioned B.O. The theory goes that women unconsciously sniff out men whose immune system is different from theirs, which could help mm. to guarantee healthy babies. It's controversial stuff, but if it's true, it means that B.O. might be more important in courtship than most people think. Which is why we find Horace beefing up his whiff, prior to a spot of mate attracting. So, let's see if there are any women out there who find Horace's whiff the perfect pong for the creation of healthy offspring. Oh dear. Keep on dreaming, Horace. <laughs> mm. Later on Experimental, we'll be finding out how Australians feel about cane toads. I think we've got to kill them. But first, let's travel to Singapore, where they have a thing about chickens. Look at any menu in any restaurant in Singapore and you'll find that chicken, in all its unusual varieties, dominates the dishes. From chicken rice to phoenix claws, which are... Well, I think you can see what they are. But when they're not eating chickens, the citizens of Singapore seem to have pretty strong feelings about their welfare. At least, that would seem to be the case from research being carried out by Dr Chuk at Nanyang Technological University. When I was a, a, a little boy, uh, my grandfather had uh, a lot of chickens in the backyard and uh, I was the only child and, a, and the only grandchild, so m most of my friends were chickens. <laughs> oh, that's sweet, I think. And it's shown, you know, by scientific tests that if you touch chickens, uh, they, they grow faster and they lay more eggs. And so they, there's a measure of, uh, of poultry pleasure and it increases the poultry pleasure in a scientific way. The chicken Dr Chuck most likes to give poultry pleasure to is this cocky little chap, Chirp. With Dr Chuck hard at work in his lab, Chirp spends most of his days alone in his sad green research cage, deprived of the human caress he craves so much. But not for long. I wanted to develop a new type of system where no matter where you are in the world, whether you're off first or on the other side of the globe, you can actually pet, have, have a communication with your pet through touch. And this is why we developed this system. What Dr Chuck is talking about is poultry internet touching, or PIT. You see, TV and radio deal with sound and vision, but no one has managed to transmit touch like this before. If we touch ourselves, the signal is transmitted to our brain and we feel that uh, f feeling of uh, touch sensation. In this case here, we're using the internet as kind of a nerve fibre. Within our bodies, and chirps as well, lie thousands of nerve fibres and pressure-sensitive cells. So, when we pet our chickens, dogs or cats, their cells are stimulated and an electrical impulse travels up the nerves in their bodies to their brain and thus they feel the caress of their beloved owner. It's much the same with us. On each of our hands, we have upwards of 17,000 of these cells, so our touch is very sensitive. 
<laughs> For Dr Chook's device, though, it's a bit more rough and ready. On the body of his remote chicken doll, he has placed five pressure-sensitive pads that detect when they are touched by him. That information is sent over the net to these vibrating widgets, placed in a handsome chicken suit. When the pads are touched by Dr Chook, the widgets vibrate in the same place on the chicken's body. So what we have here is the actual uh, chicken jacket and inside here we have sensors and also the touch mechanism. So when you put this on the chicken, it will feel the uh, touch remotely. So very simply, you just uh, get your pet chicken and very comfortably uh, you put the jacket uh, and it's a very uh, lovely and soft material so it feels very comfortable for the chicken. And that's basically it, it just wears this jacket and it will feel the touch from anywhere in the world. But hold on, Dr Chook. Touch is a two-way thing. It's no good simply touching Chirp. We need to get an idea of how the poor bird is feeling. So what happens is that in the backyard, we are tracking the pet chicken with a camera and it sends the signal through the internet and then this uh, moving mechanism moves the doll according to the actual position of the chicken in the backyard. So I can see the pet chicken move in, represented by the pet doll here. You can actually feel the chicken? Yes, I can. I can actually change my touch according to how the chicken is moving and I can also affect the chicken's movement by, by my touch. So how does the chicken feel about this? Dr Chook worked this out by having Chirp repeatedly choose between two coloured doors, behind one of which lay his stylish chicken suit. What happens is that if it goes into the blue door, it will receive food and water and no uh, poultry internet uh, touching. <laughs> and if it goes into the red door, it will see, receive the same food and water, but 10 minutes of the uh, poultry internet jacket touching. <laughs> Now, over a period of one month, we found that over 80% of the time, the chicken preferred the door where it will receive the poultry internet system. So we can actually, using this technique, prove that the chicken preferred to use that uh, poultry internet jacket, and so it actually is feeling some kind of pleasure. <laughs> it might only be a few little pads vibrating, but it's enough to give chirp pleasure. Something that's floating Dr Chook's boat back in the lab. It feels very exciting. It feels like I am actually physically interacting with my real pet, even though this pet could be in the other side of the world. All this human-chicken interaction might seem odd, or indeed somewhat disturbing. But luckily for him, caressing chickens remotely is not the sole purpose of Dr Chook's research. This is just the first system. What we're really interested in is the wide area of human-to-pet communication using digital media. So what we see in the future is that people use this for their cats and for their dogs and their pet hamster. Cats, dogs, hamsters, wives, girlfriends, complete strangers. <laughs> Still to come on Experimental, how to save the planet with olive oil and then celebrate with a slug of your own urine. Mm. But before the water sports, what about heading to the rainforest of Australia's Northern Territory with the aim of slaughtering a few cane toads? An alien species these poison hoppers are described as the number one threat to Australian wildlife. Environmentalists have been trying to wipe them out for years, with little success. But now there's new hope, because they've discovered that cane toads love to disco. It seems they have a fatal obsession with UV lights, as Graham Sawyer of Frogwatch, yes, Frogwatch, explains. Well, once we found the toads were, were disco freaks and like hanging around those blue lights, we decided that that gave us a real edge in terms of trying to eradicate them. So we're now on, the, on that pathway of wiping out cane toads using their disco habit. Cane toads were brought to Australia in 1935 to eat the beetles that were destroying the country's sugarcane fields. The toads didn't fancy the beetles much, but they did love to breed. Today, there are around 100 million of them. They'll eat almost anything they can stuff in their mouths. Australian wildlife just can't compete. 
In the last 70 years, they've been travelling at up to a kilometre and a half a night, and their relentless march has taken them right across Australia. Now they threaten Darwin, capital of the Northern Territories. The problem is, very few things in Australia can eat a cane toad. They contain a poison so strong, it can kill crocodiles, snakes and just about any other predator in minutes. Even the eggs and tadpoles are poisonous. It's basically just man against the toads, but they've proved remarkably difficult to kill. But of course, no self-respecting Australian is going to let a toad get the better of him. I think we've got to kill them. Uh, simple as that. We've got to stop their advance and uh, we've got to stop them in their tracks before they, uh, they start uh, stuffing up our uh, pristine wilderness. And local member of parliament, David Tolner, has a simple solution. I think there's many ways to uh, deliver a killing blow, uh, certainly with a golf club, uh, lumps of wood, cricket bats, uh, we'll all do the job. But even with the best handicap in the world, no golfer's ever going to stem the cane toad invasion with a nine iron. <laughs> She's having a bit of fun. What's needed is the perfect trap, baited with something a cane toad just can't resist. Basically, we were playing around with different wavelengths of, of UV, and the shops in town had a number of different types of UV light, so we just decided, OK, give us one of each of those and we'll take them out and try them. And it was just over that wall over there where we set up the trap with the first black light on it and it caught 109 cane toads in its first week. But what's so special about UV light? Lynn Schwarzkopf of James Cook University. It could be that there's something about UV light that attracts toads. There are um, animals that respond to UV light, not toads that I know of. But there are lots of insects that um, use UV light for orienting, and um, so it may be that more insects are attracted to the light, and that attracts more toads. And now they're adding music to the light show. Okay, put the cage down. Schwarzkopf and colleague Ross Alford have been experimenting with the mating call of the male toad. If the toad is attracted by the mating call, then it should move to the source of the sound and ignore the dummy loudspeakers. As it turns out, both males and females are quite attracted to the sound, probably because the sound of a calling male signals the presence of water, um, and they're always on the lookout for water. We were talking about these things as little discos in the bush, but we've got one over behind me, which has also got an audio system on it that plays the mating call of the male non-stop all night, so we've got music and, and disco lights. It's a place where they like to hang out. <laughs> yeah, we were waiting to see whether we caught all the teenage toes at that place. I know what you're thinking. What happens to all the trapped cane toads now? Are they shipped off to the local golf club for driving practice? Some find their way into the local souvenir shops, but to be honest, that's a rather limited market. No, it turns out that cane toads might be of use to Australian agriculture after all. After they've been collected from the traps, the toads are bagged up and taken back to Darwin, where they're gassed with carbon dioxide and stored in the freezer before being carted off to the local fertiliser plant. And if any escape, well, at least we know where to find them. In a moment, we're off to the kitchens of the University of Toronto to meet a man who thinks he can power the world with olive oil. But before that, let's knock off to the test department for a gulp of the amber nectar. Meet Tester X. She does have a name, but we're not going to tell you what it is. But why? Because she is about to do something she doesn't want her friends to know about. She's going to drink her own wee-wee. 
But before we watch her gulp, let's just find out what this wee stuff is. Basically, it's the rubbish the kidneys flush out. Principally salts, a liquid called urea, and finally the stuff which makes it watery, which is, well, water. So back to the main event. Although our tester is strange, she's not so odd. What she's going to do is get rid of the er bits of the urine and keep the water. And for that, she's going to use a very basic chemical technique. Distillation. What happens is that the nice, clean and sweet to the taste water is boiling off, whilst the nasty, yellow, you don't want to drink them type bits are being left behind. Once the steam condenses at the end of this pipe, there's nothing left other than good old H2O. Nice and very useful if you've never heard of a tap. <laughs> Environmentalists are always banging on about energy. How we need to cut down on the amount we use, or else it's all going to run out. Moan, moan, moan. Trouble is, they're probably right. So what if I told you that somebody had invented a way of harnessing freely available energy that was cheap, practically invisible, and completely wireless? Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? Here at the University of Toronto, Professor Ted Sargent is doing just that. Inside this bottle are millions of tiny particles, called quantum dots, that can be painted onto the surface of just about everything. Each dot is a microscopic solar panel, capable of converting infrared light from the sun's rays into usable electricity. And the raw material for this nanotechnology miracle is more at home in the kitchen than in the lab. It's olive oil. Yeah, we basically grow these quantum dots, these little semiconductor particles, in a vat of olive oil. What's going on is little more than clever cooking. Two chemicals are added to the oil and some fancy heating and bubbling goes on until you end up with quantum dots of semiconductor each a few billionths of a metre in diameter. And it's that size that makes them tuned to infrared light. In the future, appliances coated with them should be able to power themselves, not only from infrared light streaming through the window, but even more amazingly, because they are tuned to infrared light, the best lit appliances could share surplus energy with those in the shade by producing infrared beams of their own. And this is how it works. The quantum dot solution is sprayed between a sandwich of electrical materials. When infrared energy from the sun or from another appliance hits them, the dots get excited and lose electrons, which travel as an electrical current. This current can then be used to power whatever the sandwich is connected to. Traditional solar cells work a similar way, but they haven't really taken off because they need great big chunks of silicon that are expensive and very difficult to make. So nanotechnology, through engineering at the atomic and the molecular scale, is giving us control of these, over these materials so they can harness the sun's power efficiently. The sun blasts our planet with 10,000 times more energy than we currently consume through power stations. And to match our energy needs, we'd only need to cover one thousandth of the Earth's surface with Ted's quantum dots. That's roughly the same as the area of the USA that is paved. And with our ever more power-hungry lifestyles, perhaps it won't be long until we see contractors painting office blocks with Ted's techno salad dressing. Mind you, if all the olive oil is going to be used to help power the world, what on earth are we going to put on our salad? <laughs> <laughs> 